Um, so I would first like to say hello and welcome everybody um, to our second book review, which is something that we really are enjoying at the Divinity Institute. Uh, my name is uh, Marla Kunin, and I am the Executive for Strategy and Stakeholder Management here at the Institute. I see many of you whose names I recognize, um, and it really is amazing for me to see many alumnus um, in the audience, as well as just in general, the people that are joining. For us, this is something that we've um, started last year and which we intend to do at least four times a year, which is to review a specific book and to take someone, either an alumnus, or in this case, it's Dr. Heather Good, an academic at our institution and a faculty member, um, to actually review a book. So today I'm really excited because last year we worked with one of our alumnus um, who reviewed a specific book. But this year, I'm really excited because of, of our first book review this year, we've actually got Ross Saunders, who is a Da Vinci alumnus and has self-published and written a book. And um, Heather, Dr. Heather Good is going to be reviewing the book with us. And we really hope that you guys will unmute your mics and comment, that you will add to the chat box, that you will um, you know, add questions that you've got throughout the process, um, and also that you will feel free to raise a hand and engage with us in the conversation. Both Ross and Heather really want to engage on the topic and the idea. And even if you haven't had the opportunity to read the book, Heather will review it for you. Ross will um, give you some extracts from the book and we will tell you how you can purchase the book should you want to afterwards. So I think for me, the one thing that um, I know it's blocking a little bit, but you'll see behind me, it says connect meaningfully. And I think for me, the book reviews are a way that we can really connect meaningfully because in this respect, we get to actually engage um, our academic minds and look at something and really sort of um, analyze and speak about it. And we've, we're going to, um, I said to Ross that I'd like to challenge him and say, you know, have things changed um, since COVID with some of his, um, you know, points that he's made. So please feel free to ask as many questions and whatever questions you would like to. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to, um, Heather will introduce Ross to you, but I will introduce Heather to you. Dr. Heather Good is really, um, I know many of you do know her, but she is an absolute educationist to the T. She, besides the fact that she has a PhD in education, um, Heather's passion for education traverses all levels. She truly takes the student experience from the start to the finish. Um, and for her, it is really about the contribution of knowledge. Over and above that, um, Heather is somebody who I really respect and admire for her ideas and her ability to actually translate ideas into something translatable. So if I ever find a text that I cannot understand, um, I will phone her and say, Heather, can you please put on your Dr. Good hat? Um, and I always say her surname suits her. And can you please analyze this for me? And I think that um, it really is a skill of yours, Heather. So I really look forward um, to seeing the way that you unpack this. We've also launched the Da Vinci blog and Heather's a regular contributor um, to the Da Vinci blog. So coming up, you'll see a lot of blog posts from her. And um, we will also be recording this session and we will be editing it and putting it up um, on our YouTube channel for those of you who either have to leave or couldn't, um, you know, or someone, you know, couldn't make the session or you just want to listen to it again. So Dr. Heather Good, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Marla Koonin. Um, I've known Marla for, for several years, but it's always nice having somebody who knows you introduce you and make you sound good. So thanks, Marla. <laughs> uh, Ross, I want to say a really big welcome to you. So I first Thank met you. Uh, a few years ago when I started at Da Vinci and Ross was lecturing for Da Vinci. And then I found out that he was an alumni of Da Vinci. And we had some interesting coffee conversations and Ross is a very passionate person about his fields. And um, Ross, I've, I've started to think of you more as a polymath than, than as a specialist, I, I must admit. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you started as a specialist and then you moved into management and um, you started managing in the context of a global team. But yeah. out of experience, you, you really got passionate about learning to manage better. And you've managed many kinds of different teams, technical teams, development teams, call centers. You've worked with us at Da Vinci. You've looked at software divisions in South Africa. And you're now on your own as a consultant, public speaker, workshop facilitator, and specialist. 
And you've migrated a bit more into data, data protection, privacy program management, cybersecurity, and you're one of the people I would come to absolutely with questions about Poppy and information security. And you're also a person that can translate technical subjects into easy to understand concepts. So I always find your blogs useful when I read them because I can understand some of the IT behind them. And I think so that <laughs> that's great. That ability you used in your, your, your master's degree. Um, so you've got a, you have a master's in the management of technology and innovation from Da Vinci. And you've also got a lot of specialist um, certifications and designations in the legal aspects of ethical hacking, paralegal practice. And you were a past president of the, the Professional Speakers Association of Southern Africa. And you're currently also a member of the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers. And you serve as co-chair of the Johannesburg chapter of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. And I think that's one of the things I've enjoyed about you is is Rust, you're not only able to share your knowledge to people who are not specialists in the field, but you're able to share your knowledge in such a way that your colleagues and peers respect you. So it was a pleasure having you on faculty when you were available to be on faculty, but it is a lot of fun to have you here today. And I really enjoyed your book. So I wanted to give you a real um, thumbs up on that, and I'm hoping I can show you. This is the book Ross that, um, wrote. It's not what I signed up for. And it, he describes it as a survival guide for first-time managers. And Ross, I just want to explore with you a little bit. What inspired you to write this book? Um, you know, for my last part of my corporate career, I was actually um, sitting in a hiring manager role. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we got into was moving people from specialist roles into management because that, that was our kind of goal as a company was to yeah. bring people in who were graduates, grow them um, within the business, and then have them move into those roles if they were suited to it. But um, between that and between earlier in my career being moved into management in much the same way, I I realized there's no manual for this. <laughs> there's, and like academic descriptions and models and things can get you so far, but there are actual practical implications in the business and how you're actually going to deal with people, which is a major um, difference and differentiating factor there. Mm. I think that's something we talk about a lot at Divincy and especially in the classes, being a good accountant doesn't make you a good manager of accountants. Being a good mm. technical person doesn't make you a good manager of technical people. So yeah. that transition is quite a challenging transition. What do you think is the most important interpersonal skill a manager needs? Oh, there are a lot of different skills. Um, you know, I, I think it boils down to, I think, communication. That would be something that I would think is a critical key point of it. Uh, and mm. I know that's kind of broad in the space, but a, a, pretty much everything you do as a manager is going to relate to communication in some way. Um, and that's communication both ways, be it listening as well as um, talking. It's the whole two ears, one mouth, use them in proportion. Um, so uh, I think that- And that's from a professional speaker is saying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's great. So, Russ, um, what's your favorite part of the book? What is the, the piece of the book that you really enjoy? Um, it, it, it's hard to pick a favorite. Um, I think going at a, at a bit of a higher level, the telling the different stories that I've had through the years has, is basically mm. my sort of favorite collection of parts of the book because the, the book comes from stories. It's um, every chapter that's in there has some sort of related story or incident that happened in my management career that, that got me to learning about that. Mm. I think that's something I enjoyed about your book was both the readability and the fact that you're demonstrating learning from experience. So you've integrated well-known principles with your own experience and learned from them. And I, I really love that reflective learning approach that you mm. approach. I know we asked you to prepare a small piece to read so that everyone could have a taste of your book. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you for a few minutes and then I've got some more questions. But if anybody else wants to um, ask questions during um, today, just ask that you uh, pop it in the chat. We're keeping an eye on the chat. 
We will have a live Q&A session at the end. So I'll ask you not to put your hands up yet, but if you want to just catch a question, we'll look at it in the chat. And if there's anything that's unanswered, we'll pick it up afterwards. So uh, Ross, over to you. Cool. So uh, I've selected a passage which was basically my golden rule when I was hiring people and when people moved into management. Um, it's one of the things that I absolutely insisted on. So I, I'm going to take from the, the section called carry a notebook um, and just read Great. the first page. Of it. So my golden rule for any new team member, be they manager or contributor, is to keep a notebook and pen with them at all times. This was one of my best, one of the best lessons I've ever learned in my career. Many years ago, I had a particularly strict boss who insisted on this when I went into management. It became my absolute must-have accessory. There are a number of reasons why you should carry a notebook, with time management being one of them. The key thing to remember here is that you're not going to remember key things if you try and keep it all in your head. This relates to to-do lists, ideas, or any seemingly flippant comment in a meeting. Your notebook serves to be an extension of your memory. And while you may choose to take notes in an online service or app on your phone, I'd highly recommend taking physical notes for numerous reasons. One, if you're taking notes on your phone in a meeting, you are likely to come across as rude. People in the meeting room will not know whether you're taking notes or messaging someone to tell them how bored you are. Most people will naturally assume the worst, so you'll quickly be lumped into the category of not paying attention. Where possible, preferably use a tablet or a notebook computer. Two, the act of taking notes sets the minds of those around you at ease. How often have you been to a restaurant where the waiter takes your order without taking notes? It's kind of nerve wracking, right? If they're taking notes, you have a lot more comfort that you're going to be taken care of. The same applies in the boardroom. And three, writing with a pen and paper is a tried and tested method for aiding your memory as opposed to typing a note on a device. A study in 2014 published by the Psych Psychological Science Journal stated that writing notes by hand aids long-term retention of conceptual information. While typing means you have taken something down word for word, writing often means that you have thought about it, given that we generally write at a slower speed than we type. Um, I think, sorry to interrupt, Heather. Um, I see there is a question, but I actually think it's mm. really interesting, Ross, because I mean, for me, I know that if somebody, if uh, your concept of the waitress, if somebody comes to me at a table and I've got a big order and then um, they don't have a book, I always ask them to please repeat my order back to me. And it's quite fascinating, actually, that when we think about it in a boardroom, something that bothers me at the moment um, from a technological perspective is people are quite disengaged in meetings, um, you know, with online and those type of things. But even prior to COVID, so I almost feel like people use technology as an excuse. So say they'll sit with their computer and say, oh, they're just taking notes. But then when you actually, if you walk behind them or whatever, they're doing emails or they're responding to things. Um, how do you advise managers with regards to something like this? So taking the notes and being engaged is a beautiful way of looking at it. But what if with technology now people are like, okay, well, I'll take notes on my laptop. How, how do we keep people engaged? And to the audience, I don't know if any of you find this, but we're finding that with a lot of the online sessions, so with Zoom and MS Teams, sometimes people are busy doing mails or other things. And I always laugh when I'm presenting and someone accidentally replies to one of my mails. Um, you know, you can call them on it then, but not really when it's, um, you know, say in another type of session. So I know that's a bit of a loaded kind of long-winded comment, mm -hmm. but and I would be interested to see what others feel as well. I think it comes down to two different levels there. Um, so one of the lessons that I learned along the way, and it's in the communication section of the book, uh, it was a, a it's a skill that you learn to pay attention, I think. And it's a skill that mm. we lose very quickly when we're using, using devices. And one of the communications um, workshops that I was on many years ago, there was a whole exercise where you had to sit on your hands um, and actually not fiddle with anything and pay attention to someone and repeat what they'd said back to them how you understood it. And that was a phenomenal exercise for me to realize just how little we pay attention and how much we listen to respond as opposed to listening to understand. Um, mm -hmm. And that listening to understand exercise is a lot of what got me to the point of paying attention. Now, that, that's another reason I like a notepad or notebook. Um, and perhaps, and when I started as a manager, that's what I used. It's a note, notebook and pay, a pen and paper, basically. 
there I can't be on WhatsApp. <laughs> I'm like in a notebook. That's that's as far as it goes. Um, yes. But you develop that paying attention skill. And I used to put that onto my staff as well. Even if they weren't in a management role, have a pen and paper with you so you can take notes. Um, and then, I mean, a team member that I had, which I probably wouldn't recommend this to anyone, he would keep little, those many bar ones. And if someone wasn't paying attention, he'd throw it at them. So you kind of got a yay, ah kind of thing because you got hit by a bar one, but at least it's a bar one. <laughs> so the, the, I think it comes down to everyone individually. You need to, people need to be aware that they need to concentrate, but I think there's people don't realize they are not concentrating until it's too late and they mm. missed the sentence or something like that. Um, and more um, so, I see people are posing team. questions as well here in the great. chat. Yes, no, that's well. Um, um, Ross, I'm with you about writing things down. I also find as a manager, because there's like five people looking for you or wanting things from you, um, that if you don't make a note of things, you've moved on to another subject and you lose things. Mm. So it's pause and say, hang on a minute, let me just jot that down. And you can come back to things later. It makes a difference. So yes, I'm a big fan of that. Ross, I'm going to go to a couple of our audience questions at, at this sure. point. Um, the, the first question was about managing a diverse team from Bradley. Um, and he asked, do you have a preferred ideology or methodology for managing members of diverse teams? So he says diversity in terms of age, gender, race, culture. And I think in South Africa, we're very used to diverse teams. So what is your preferred approach? So that, that's a spot on question. So I, I do cover that briefly in the book as well, because that was one of the challenges I had through the whole route. Um, I don't have a preferred, like one of the things about the book is I, I try not to adopt a specific ideology or methodology or something like that, because you're boxing yourself in potentially. Um, mm -hmm. But when it comes to the diversity, one of the big things about me is find out, uh, and speaking to what Heather has said now, we're used to diversity in South Africa, and we're used to diversity as a statement and a um, concept, but do we actually explore it? Uh, that That's, I think, where it comes in. So one of the things I say in there is you've got to find out about the different cultures in your teams uh, and, you know, ask people sometimes we're very shy to ask people about their culture because we don't want to come across as, as being mm. uh, inept or, or naive or, or anything like that. But often asking the silly question is what actually gets people to bond with you as well. So, I mean, I learned a lot about culture and like patriarchal culture versus the work side of things and where like, folks battle to take perhaps orders from a female staff member versus mm. a male and things like that. And the, the thing is to ask and approach it on a case by case basis, I think. So I think mm. get the four dummies books and, and learn about the different religions that your teams have learn about the um, cultures of people, you know, use, um, I mean, we, we've got heritage day here, do something in the environment where everyone has to give a speech on their uh, heritage you'll learn about the cultures that way as well. Mm. Ross, you're confirming something I've been reading more of lately, and that is that we actually have to notice people's diversity. And, and to say that I don't see race or I don't see age, you're actually starting to lose the individuality of the person in front of you. And, and so acknowledging that is really important. And I suppose as a manager, one of my experiences was when somebody came to tell me they were pregnant, it was really important in their religion and culture that it wasn't announced. And I had to respect that. So we have to follow company processes, but confidentially. And that sort of has an impact on throwing a baby shower because some cultures want the baby shower after the birth of the baby and others before. And in the workplace, you have to have an agreed way of going forward and respect the individual's wishes. So that's really important, good advice. So Russ, um, you published this book just before COVID, um, literally just before COVID was discovered in China. And yep. I wonder, after the last 18 months, there's something you would add to the book or change? Um, I would possibly adapt it a little more to the working online space. Um, it, it's interesting, before COVID, my view was to try and keep it away from being too technical and, and tech involved, because I mean, that's mm. the space I've always been in. And there are sections in the book around managing your calendar and outlook and folders and stuff like that. Uh, but I wanted to keep that to a minimum. I think now, would I had I done it now, I would probably have a whole lot more 
on engagement over Zoom and presenting and, and how you actually um, can keep people engaged in this sort of like virtual box that we're in now. Uh, yes. I think that, that's where I would focus a bit more time. And I think that links to Delia's question, um, which is about working from anywhere and as opposed to the traditional approach of utilizing physical workspace as a team. How do we build that team concept and that belongingness? Because relationships online are different. Mm. So, I mean, there I'm going to come a little bit to a tech answer as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fine and well to have these Zoom meetings and it's, it's you have these, um, like I saw a coffee mug once that said, I survived a meeting that could have been an email. And I think for the sake of trying to engage with people, we have these meetings over and over and we have meetings for things that shouldn't necessarily be a meeting. And that I think adds to the fatigue of having these meetings. Um, I think, you know, getting the engagement going now, there are different, and I mean, it, it takes learning new skills as well, but I've seen a, a company using something called Discord. And Discord is a chat platform that gamers use, computer gamers, where they're talking amongst their team so they can strategize and things like that. But it's not like a meeting. It's actually just audio and your microphone remains muted until you speak. And then it speaks and everyone can hear you. So it actually almost creates that open plan office kind of vibe where everyone's mm -hmm. on mute while they're typing. But the second you say something, everyone can hear you. And I've seen a couple of companies using that. Uh, and then also companies doing very specific um, team buildings with platforms like this, platforms like venue.live that's coming up now, which is specifically around engaging remote teams and all of that. And, and uh, I think keeping abreast of that and not moving into the virtual space, we can't take the same team building as we've had in the physical space. It doesn't work. We need to adapt it as we go. So what you're yes. alluding to is that we as managers have to keep learning, whether it's tech, whether it's a change in environment, a different company or a different team, we've just got to keep learning. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Mutambara's question as well is also around, which is something I'm quite interested in as well. Um, um, Dr. Mutambara, if I'm not mistaken, you're also asking around time management strategies. Yes, I was about to go there. Yeah, yeah. during this new normal, because I think we're all feeling like you just work all the time, um, but at the same time, sometimes you don't feel as effective as in the office environment. Um, okay, shall I jump in there, Heather? I don't know if you've got go anything for to it. No, no, Marla <laughs> just stole the words from her mouth, so go for it. <laughs> cool. So, I mean, what I think there, you know, some of the companies that have successfully transitioned to this remote work kind of space have gone through the exercises of changing KPIs from being looking, and I think I saw a question somewhere in as well, uh, it's changing KPIs from these task-based things where you've got to constantly look busy to outcomes-based things where it's, you know, these are the outcomes we expect from you. We don't mind whether you do them at two in the morning or whatever. It, this needs to be done by Friday. If you deliver that by Tuesday, then fantastic. Um, your, your actual KPI is done. And that, I think, creates a working culture for this remote kind of mm -hmm. space. I mean, there's some roles that that's not going to work effectively in to a degree, like if you've got cold calling marketing and things like that. But um, in a lot of ways, you can change the KPIs around, but that also relies on the executive being on board with it and, and that trickling through the organization. Um, yes, one of the sections of your book is performance management. And, and I think yeah. linking what you said, how you set KPIs, and what your KPIs are and getting agreement with those is really key. What, what I've seen, though, is a lot of really badly written KPIs. What's your advice for setting KPIs for, for somebody, especially with the online environment, so that you can manage for time? Because I think if your goal is not clear, we can't manage the time bar. Yeah. So, I mean... <laughs> It, it depends, but you've got to write a KPI so it's actually got value at the end of the day. Um, having a KPI of someone needs to make 30 calls a day um, or something like that is not necessarily measuring value. It's measuring what you're doing, which is being busy. Mm -hmm. um, having more like, you know what, get five positive responses in a day could be a, a little bit of a different thing. And that, that talks to the ratios that you're looking at because it's often the ratio you're going to get or, or even less generally on cold calling. But, 
you need to look at the value that's going to come out of it. Can, can you extract value from the KPI? And you need to actually sit down and think about it because it's it's really easy to put down KPIs, look at what someone is doing for a day and say, okay, well, that looks correct. And, and let's put it down as a KPI. Um, that doesn't mean someone's performing. It, it just means they're, they're ticking a checklist of their job. Um, whereas real value or working your KPIs out regularly, like setting a KPI and having the same KPI for six years is just pointless, I think. Um, you've got to set up tasks as well. Like some of the best KPIs I've seen in use is where it's actual specific tasks every three months. So your KPI for this quarter is you need to implement this system uh, and have the dry run ready or proof of concept ready by the end of the quarter. Then you can measure someone against that, whether they've worked at two in the morning or three in the morning, or they've traveled overseas when we could and worked from remote sites. It makes no difference then if the deliverable is there. And that's the value that you get from it, I think. Yes, I like what you're saying. And I think it means we need to know what is a leading indicator of results and what activity actually gets us results and what mm. moves closer to our targets and outcomes. And I think sometimes there's a, a sense of busy work, you know, reporting on what you're doing, which takes up time, but actually doesn't move you closer to your goal. Yeah. So what was the best advice you ever got from a mentor? Because you do refer to some mentors and managers who who gave you mm. advice on your journey. And I don't think we can manage alone. <laughs> yeah, so while well, speaking about managing alone, I think one of the best pieces of advice I got as a manager was to delegate. And it was also one of the mm. hardest things to actually implement because coming from Ooh, being yes. in a specialist role where this is mine, <laughs> my role, and I want to do it, to, okay, here you go, you guys need to do this, um, is something you need to learn. And you've got to be prepared for someone who's learning to fail. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's like someone is not going to learn unless you give them something to do. And I think that that letting go coupled with um, being able to delegate is, is a really a good side of it. And I think the other piece of advice that came through really well, and it's something that rings true today, is if you if you have a serious incident or you've got something that requires a decision, you actually need to make the decision. Um, right or wrong, often acting quickly is much more in your favor than waiting for something to play out. Mm. Um, and I think that was something that was also very, very valuable um, in advice because in, in any space, really leaving something to fester makes it so much worse while you, you are stuck in analysis paralysis um, and you don't want to be there. Yes, and a lot of us avoid conflict. So we don't like confronting bad behavior or somebody who's toxic to the team or who hasn't realized that their behavior is impacting the team. But you're right yeah. about festering. So I know that um, the five sections of your book um, are quite useful. So the one was communication and listening, time management, delegation, performance management, and conflict. And I think the balance of those five areas and how they interplay is very useful. Um, I see there's a question from Dr. Linda Chapunza, and she said, in corporate culture, it's a sign of being busy and looking clever if you have your laptop in a meeting. How do we dispel this myth? Because what you're wanting is contribution and engagement, but here we have this idea of we need to look important and busy and we have to answer our stuff now. Uh, you know what, to be honest, I think that comes down to individual corporate culture. Um, it What what comes down as acceptable within a culture? Uh, you know, if someone, if I had an employee or someone in a meeting that I was holding or like my partners uh, in the consulting space and they were sitting on their laptop, not paying attention to the meeting, I'd, I'd probably lose my rag a little bit there. Um, you, you, it's, you know, as much as there's this thing of being busy, there's also being in control of the meeting and things like that as well. And it's corporate culture. So you have to have the culture in the organization that says, you know what, it is not okay to not be paying attention in a meeting. If you are acting busy on your laptop to look clever, and that's what the entire corporate culture is, I don't think you're going to get far in the in the meetings. But if the person call, like it's something I said in one, one of the chapters as well. If you're calling a meeting, you are in charge of that meeting you can actually take control of it. And it's it, it's a good thing to take control of it. So if, mm. if you're hosting a meeting and people are doing that and it's not acceptable to you, say something. Say, this isn't acceptable. I want you to pay attention now. Please close your laptops. And if they refuse to close your close their laptops, they shouldn't be in the meeting to begin with. Um, and that, that's sort of my 
angry view on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all been frustrated, but you're right. I think um, learning to run good meetings with a proper agenda and a proper uh, behavior style is, is really key to keeping people on target. Russ, um, you've published this book and you self-published, and I know you're available now through, um, we can order through your website, through Amazon, through Smashwords, you're on Barnes and Nobles, and if somebody has a Scribe subscription, they can read your book. But what advice do you have for aspiring authors or people thinking about writing a book? Uh, oh, there was so much that I learned in the process of writing it. Um, there, there's so much advice I could give, I think. Um, but, you know, I think one of the, the key things is to keep at it. It's very easy um, to let it slide or to get to the point where, you know, it's good enough now and I'm going to release it. The One of the best things I could have done, uh, and this delayed the release of the book by a good seven, eight months, um, was I got beta readers where I took what I thought was yes. finished just before it was going to go to the um, editors. And I said, this is good enough because I am sick of writing now. I've been writing for 18 months and let's just get this done. It, it felt much like a dissertation. Um, and then got it out to the beta readers. The beta readers were like, oh, this was cool. But one of my beta readers was also a, a writing coach. And nice. he took it and he read it and he stopped sort of four chapters in. And he was like, no, look, it's great and it's technical, but where's the heart? And it took him like bringing that out of me and, and giving me honest feedback. So if you do get if you do want someone to read your book and all of that, get someone who's going to give you honest feedback and not necessarily pull punches or anything like that. Say like, oh, wow, great job. You wrote a book, but the advice is not actually helping you. Uh, the, the writing coach was fantastic. And that's how a lot more of the stories made it into the book, how a lot of them got fleshed out and all of that. And it's a mm -hmm. much better read now. I think what you're saying is crucial. Your, your real friends tell you what you need to hear, not what you want. <laughs> yes. <laughs> something um, when we write theses and research papers sometimes we ask for feedback but what we're looking for is affirmation yes yes your needs is is quite quite valid i see janet commented on your comments about facilitation on the meeting that the onus is on the facilitator to engage people rather than expecting them to be engaged and i, I think that mutuality of running an interesting meeting that's on point is is really valid thanks mm. Um, so your book has um, challenged us to also think about how do we prepare manage, uh, prepare as, uh, aspiring managers. And I read in when I was researching just around this book that nobody wants to be promoted to fail. And yet the principle suggests that a lot of people are promoted until they fail. And, and there's a, normally a story behind that. But some of the research conducted shows that up to 60% of new managers fail within the first two years of their new positions, or they have something happen that forces them to go through some sort of compulsory training or conflict management. Um, that seems to come up a lot. How should we be preparing people to be a manager? Because when I talk to new graduates, everybody expects to be a manager. Everybody expects to become a CEO. And, and how do we prepare people for the reality when moving from a specialized thing to being a manager, even before they're there? You know, I, 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 so this comes into another sort of space that I've already been passionate in. And it, it's something that I've learned over the years of, like you say, being in specialization and being in mm -hmm. management. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we can make is to instill in people that they have to be managers. You, you don't have to be managers. The money is not always in management. In fact, the money in specialization is way higher than in management in a lot of cases. Um, and, you know, there are these two tracks. And we, we, there's, there's a book on this, The Leadership Pipeline, where, yes. you know, you can specialize and you can go a management track. And your management track should be a constant growth in different directions. And your specialization track will be constant growth in a specialization. And, you know, it's, I think that's the first step is people don't always have to be managers. We need to stop making people think that they have to be a manager. Um, 
when it comes to people who do want to be managers and, and really want to get in there for the re right reasons, uh, I think we need to prepare people that it is not an easy ride. Um, it's when you it, it's no longer individual when you're a manager. And when you're studying, it's individual for the most part. You might have group work, but it, it's mostly individual. When you are learning the ropes and you're starting at the call desk or, or as internal sales or something like that, just out of varsity, you're individual. Um, and you learn to become really proud of your own work, but then that is not what's needed in management. So I think preparing people that it is not going to be the same and mm. preparing people that they are going to fail. And that's okay, yes. is what you need. Um, because as long it's as you're learning. Okay to fail. As long as you're learning. Yeah. And I think this is something people underestimate is how much we learn. We're actually more open to learning when we fail than when we succeed. <laughs> yeah. and I, but again, it takes a culture because, you know, you've mm. got to be you've got to be in a, in a management leadership team from top to bottom from left to right that supports each other in that failure if it's a and i mean this talks to like sort of a worst case uh, environment where you're working on those task list kpis no one does above and beyond no one cares about each other it's getting my checklist done uh, then you are going to get pushed out or something like that. But if, mm -hmm. if management works together and people help each other when they falter, you've got a fantastic recipe there. Ross, you're raising an interesting point there. I think a lot of people aspire to be managers to make a change in the company. How mm -hmm. do young managers influence corporate culture? Because sometimes it's very difficult in a big environment. It is. Um, and it, I think it comes down to both the um, communication side, but something that's mm -hmm. mentioned in the book as well is managing up. And that was a yes. big thing that I had to learn because you talk about people wanting to go into management to um, correct things or something like that, or make a change. In my experience, what I've seen, you, you, you kind of have the two extremes where you have someone who wants to go into management to fix something and you have someone who wants to go into management for the prestige and the power of it. And those two together is is fire and water, and it, it's just it's it's quite a it's a sticky situation there. Um, but I'm I'm like losing my train of thought now because I'm going in so many different spaces. Mm. Um, needing to make this change is also often managing up, and and to make meaningful change, you need to get the buy-in of executives and things like that. And that's where you need to approach executives. And, you know, someone has not become the CEO or the COO or something by just coasting up there. It's There's a lot of work involved there. Uh, and one of the, the things I talk about about managing up is knowing how to approach them when you manage up. If you go to someone and just say, I see a problem. Okay, so what are you going to do about it? It doesn't prove that you're doing anything to change your management, mm -hmm. manage it or anything like that. If you go up to someone and you say, look, I see a problem. This is what I see it is. You know, I think if we do X, Y, and Z, we might be able to resolve it or improve it or something like that. And if I could get X, Y, Z, I think I could make some traction here. That's a whole different discussion now because you've put yeah. forward what your suggestion is. You, you're taking that thinking off the other person's plate and you're promoting yourself as someone who's thinking about this stuff. Mm. So, um Ross, in your book, um, you've positioned this as a book for new managers. And I see Janet's given a book recommendation on the, the subject of management and versus specialization. In your book, you also include some recommendations for further reading in each section. Mm. What is the very next book you think, after they've read your book, of course, what is the very next book you think a new manager should read? Um, there are a few. Um... So my my go to favorite is a very technical book, um, mm -hmm. which is called The Phoenix Project. And although it's a book around technology and an IT company and, and things like that, the principle that it's the principles that it teaches is is really good. And it's it's a story of a company and a manager, like how he learns and who he conflicts with to get this company sort of reborn and, and out of a mess kind of thing. Uh, and it's a really, really fantastic read. But outside of that, the two books I would 
look to um, making sure everyone reads uh, in, in management and out of management really is crucial conversations. Um, and I cannot mm-hmm. remember the author off, off the top of my head now. Uh, and then a book called Steal the Show by Michael Port. So Crucial Conversations is incredibly valuable in learning how to have difficult conversations with people and how to go to their mountain and things like that and understand. Um, and then Steal the Show is all about communications and it's communications in meetings, in presentations, in how you engage people, how you, and it, it's written by an actor and an acting coach and, and acting can actually work in your favor for, for presenting. So, so Russ, I like what you, you're highlighting there is both the technical aspects. I mean, in, in, in our tips model, we take the management of technology, the management of people and ideas and ideation, with, which leads to innovation as, as something that needs to be balanced within a system. And you seem to very much sense that the technical aspects and the systems impact on the people and the interpersonal skills. Um, how did you find that balance for yourself? Because not everybody gets that when they migrate to management. Yeah, I think it, I mean, it's it's a lesson hard learned. Um, for a while, when I, when I got into my first sort of executive role as well, mm-hmm. uh, it was kind of like, well, we'll fix a lot of problems with technology. And we, we kind of pushed a whole bunch of tech into the business uh, without considering the people aspect. How are people going to learn about the system? How are they going to feel about the system? Are they going to adopt the system? Are they going to um, be involved with it? Um, or is it going to be just that absolute worst push down, you will use this kind of system because it ties to KPIs? Um, yes. And it was a tremendous learning curve when the entire implementation project failed horrifically at a tremendous expense because no one wanted to use the tool. Um, mm-hmm. And then we had to do a complete redesign of everything. So that was a lesson hard learned and expensively learned that if you don't involve the people in it, you're going to have a problem. If you don't look at the broader system, because we ended up conflicting with another system in another division, and then we mm-hmm. could have just used that in the first place. And, Nothing Nothing was done sort of systemically. It was all done just like this. We're just going to do this and it'll it'll work. And it, it never did. <laughs> oh, yes, some hard-earned lessons. And just on that note, um, I see folks asked a question. How do we strike a balance on performance KPI for the individual and organizational goals? Because we have employees that meet their KPIs and their performance goals, but that then they get told there's no bonuses because the organizational goals weren't met. Um, so how how do we get that balance right? I think it comes back to what we were talking about, about designing your KPIs to add value. Your KPIs mm-hmm. need to link into the company mission, vision, values side of things. Um, and I mean, company values on paper and put on the walls is really not actually that valuable. Mission statements are not that valuable if no one buys into it. So, I mean, some of the most successful approaches I've seen to this is is things like having a huge town hall meeting where the entire complement of everyone decides on what the company's values and visions are. Like, I mean, I've seen this done with companies of 300, 400 people where you go for two days and, and they really, the executives were involved in wanting people's input for it. And they set the company values and vision as to what came out of these as the majority visions and values, not trying to push it down. Once they had that, then that trickled down via strategy meetings into divisional goals. And the divisional goals then went down into KPIs and that was outcomes-based again. We need these outcomes to reach our, our divisional goals And because the division's meeting its goal, the organization is meeting what they plan to be their goals. And in that case, it was also, you're not working on this, oh, well, everyone is scuffling around to do something, but is it the right thing to meet the goals at the end of the day? Mm. Yes, no, I I like that approach. I think it's one way to get buy-in right from the get-go instead of selling your values Mm. to everybody all the time. Russ, as we mentioned earlier, you are more recently doing a lot more work around data security, the Poppy Act, 
information security. What do managers, like what are the most important things you think managers need to know about those areas? I think it comes back to what we were saying earlier that managers should be continually learning. Um, you know, one thing about being a manager is it's not, you, and perhaps we can open the can of worms of talking between management and leadership as well. But there's management and managing, managing, managing. I like that, uh, managing <laughs> a team, and you're you're taking off the day-to-day -day tasks. There's leading where you're actually taking things forward. I think, um, and you need to be learning about the stuff around you. And and you know, the CEO is not necessarily just managing. The CEO has mm -hmm. to be aware of what his responsibilities are as a director and things like that. So it, it's very good to keep your eye on things like legislation as you start moving into sort of the middle and senior tiers of management, it starts becoming a requirement that you know this broader view outside of the organization. Um, again, talking to systemic sort of approaches, knowing what's out there, knowing what you need to look for. And, and privacy is one of those now. Um, and we've seen it a lot in Europe. And it, Privacy is very much just doing the right thing business-wise. So I would say any manager should just look at the principles of Puppy. There's, there's eight conditions in Puppy around accountability, letting people participate, being open about what you're doing. They're all pretty much conditions of good business practice. So I would say take a look there. But for any new manager as well, I would say educate your teams on their responsibilities. You can't be managing all of this alone. Um, and, you know, cybersecurity and privacy is not like it was 10 years ago where it was just the IT department's problem. Cybersecurity, privacy is every single team member's problem now. It's it, it's formed such an integral part of the business. Everyone needs to be aware of what phishing is, what um, attacks could cap and how social engineering works. It's, it's where we are as a world now. Mm. Okay, some quick fire questions just before I finish off. What are you sure. currently doing? Currently, I'm not reading a business book of any sort, but I'm reading Believe by Eddie Izzard. It's his autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, oh, interesting. Tremendous story on resilience. So I'm, I'm oh, thoroughly I enjoying it. Yeah. Are you currently writing another book? I am. I am, yes. <laughs> What's it so about? So one is coming on privacy for small businesses and how to comply with puppy oh, and cybersecurity. Nice. nice. That's great. Um what do you think you would like to be known for? Hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I think part of what I got into the privacy space for and the, the cybersecurity space for it was that I um, suffered through data breaches and I had my identity stolen. Um, and if I can Ooh. be the person that has prevented other people or businesses from suffering from that, I'll be very happy there. No, that's awesome. Yes, no, I think that would matter. That's very painful. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to open the floor if, if anybody does have questions. Marla, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add just before we go into a live Q&A. No, nothing that, specific. I see Janet's asking, when is your book coming out? Everybody wants the, the privacy for small business. <laughs> I was aiming for the, the same uh, 1st of July date, but I'm not okay. going to quite make that. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping probably August. Oh, watch the space, guys. We'll share it. Marla? And um, no, I'm just saying, I think Janet also suggested a book earlier. Um, and mm. I always find it fascinating um, in terms of one of the things we spoke earlier about being about culture and those type of things. And I mean, um, you know, I see Janet and Juliet, et cetera, is on the call as well. Is I think that the big thing about managing up, and Lindor, who's on the call, will tell you that I often speak to say that it's very easy to say manage upwards, but I think that a manager has to be open to it and an organization's culture has to be open to it. So I think the managers definitely influence culture, uh, the organizational culture, in the sense of one of the things I saw in my own PhD um, in my findings was that the more that managers embrace things like inclusivity policies and they were able to actually um, sort of breed a culture where people felt that they could communicate openly. That is when you had a lot more work satisfaction, work performance. Um, you found, I mean, I found in my own study that people felt then much more loyal towards the organization. 
and even more productive. And I think sometimes that we don't, um, speaking in Divincy speak, that we don't realize that an organization is also an ecosystem and it's made up of multiple subsystems. And people do want to have friendships at work and they do want to have relationships at work and all those things. And one of the biggest jumps I've seen that often younger managers don't understand is that when you shift into a management space and you've had friendships at work, it is something that shifts when you are now um, performance managing someone. I saw earlier, I think, um, <clears throat> Frank, it was your comments about the KPR. And I think one of the biggest things is that people often don't realize that the person managing them is actually going to um, you know, do their KPIs, et cetera. And so being a friend, and I've seen a lot of organizations really have real HR issues when there isn't that synergy between managing upwards, which is very different to being friendly with staff. And I often think managers don't strike a good balance with that. Sorry, um, so I'm just saying, when I look at Frank's comments on, around striking a balance on mm -hmm. the KPIs and organizational goals, I think this is a massive thing. Um, you know, how important are, are you know, how important are um, shared KPIs for future work to avoid disappointment? Frank, I think this is massive because mm -hmm. I think one of the big things for me is that too often organizations do not share their strategic intent with staff in an open, transparent and honest way. And then they shift goalposts in the middle. And last year, our president of the Da Vinci Institute gave quite an interesting speech, uh, uh, Edward Kisveta, around um, speaking about having a vision and having intent at the doctoral um, president's dinner. And the big thing he spoke about, which I think is really relevant, is this concept of being able to understand the strategic intent of an organization and be able to replan if need be. And I think when people have a clear vision of where they're going and they feel included then and they're part of that, I think then it's okay to shift goals when you have to, but it has to be a collective shifting. It cannot just be that management shifts and our, everyone has to fall in. And too often that is what organizations do and it's far less mm. cooperative than it should be. That's just one of my comments. Mm. So, so Ross, in your book, you do have a chapter on being promoted above peers and a, another on building trust and managing expectations. So I do think you touch on the relationship aspect that Marla's mentioned. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that was another. So I, I thing found your book quite design. useful in terms of how you've organized it and the topics you've covered. But Marla's right. Um, mm, absolutely. Consistency really helps employees meet goals. Are there any other questions from anybody? Does anybody want to put their hand up and ask Ross directly? Janet, you're putting your hand Sorry, up. Sorry, I'm trying to find unmutes and hands and all that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe just a partly a comment, partly a question is uh, around the subject of, of strategy, as Marla was just talking about just now. Sorry, that's terrible English. But anyway, um, I'm actually presenting next week at this strategy conference and my topic is agile strategy for wicked times and I think one of the challenges we have at strategic leadership level is that strategies are no longer as fixed as they used to be and could be they have to be a lot more agile and it just would be interesting to hear a comment from from you Russ around what I've just said in juxtaposed with what Myla said around, you know, how we keep big groups of people um, uh, informed of the mm. shifts that are happening in this really agile environment all the time. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm going to agree with um, Myla on this one, you know, uh, and, and yourself with being agile. It's, but it comes down to what Marlo was saying about communicating the strategy. You know, if if you are, I mean, we we saw it in one of the organizations that that I was in, is that strategy was done at the exec level and it, it was exactly what was said. It's it, the goalposts would change and things would move. And the teams weren't aware of what that was. And I think the overarching feel in the company was that, you know, um, there isn't an honesty about strategy. There was a, an inherent then distrust from the teams to the executive. Um, 
And then there was the, I told you so, or I knew this would happen when things fell apart in the company because the strategy was going badly. So they kept changing it up at the top level. It was a disaster. They never communicated it down. Instead, they just communicated, well, everything's fine. Meanwhile, the whole building was burning down in the background. And then when everything fell apart and no one got salaries, everyone was like, I knew this was gonna happen. And it was a massive distrust. Whereas on the communicating the strategies, and there's a company I work with at the moment who like they are across five continents. They have um, staff everywhere. They're not particularly large, but they have regular meetings between all the teams. And whether you're an exec or a or you're just doing reception duty, everyone is in that meeting, and everyone chats openly and frankly about strategy. They change on a dime, uh, but everyone is aware. Everyone buys in. And everyone gets told, like, if we do this correctly, this is the outcome. And everyone gets X, Y, and Z and, and all of that. Boom. They are they are clocking 100% growth year on year for the last number of years because of the way they manage people and, and things like that. It's the, Their strategy, the way they do things, the way they communicate just floors everything. No, oh, that's really, really useful, Russ. Um, I know Janet is finishing her master's and you did your master's at Da Vinci. For those still considering postgraduate studies, what was the value for you to study at Da Vinci? It changed my way of thinking. Um, I've always considered myself rational and, and analytical and all of that. But I think the process that Da Vinci follows from the systemic side and tips and like the tips model is, is phenomenal. And so this company that I was just talking about, they mm. follow the tips model. Um, that, oh, that's part of what they do. And it's it's tremendous to see what it can do, but it changed my way of thinking because then I, I got higher level on things. And you're looking down systemically now, what happens there, like causal loop diagrams and things like that. I would never have considered that in the past, but it's it's such a valuable tool to learn. Um, and it's, it's something that's in the arsenal now that, that if I need it, I've got it. Fantastic. Ross, thank you for confirming what we hope to achieve because that knowledge, that practical value of thinking well is something we want. So I'm just going to remind everybody that your book is available in ebook format on multiple platforms, especially at Amazon. And I gather you said yesterday that was the cheapest place to get it. But if you would like a hard copy, um, you can go directly onto Ross's site. You'll see that Linda has posted the links in the chat. And then Ross will um, arrange with you your preferred method of delivery. And um, that will, maybe will add to the cost a little bit if you want a physical copy. For our students, we do have two copies in the library. And I don't think it's enough, but you can get in the line if you need to. Otherwise, please contact Ross. And um, Ross, you're on LinkedIn and people can get hold of you through LinkedIn. And Absolutely. I'm just going to hand over to you for the wrap up. Um, so, Janet, to close off what you said and to maybe close off the session, um, the, the point that I was making earlier was um, when I said to you that last year at the doctoral dinner we spoke about this aspect was, um, you know, one of the big things for me is about that, um, Janet, in an agile environment, that strategy must be systemic. But I think what's really important is that you have to have clarity of purpose. So you don't only focus on what you do. But you also have to be very clear that we that you exist as an organization to serve some kind of a purpose. And I think that if we transform ourselves, so for example, at Divinci, it would be an education environment when COVID hit, we had to change things. But if you know your purpose, I think that that's a very important part of the strategy. And I think the other thing is clarity of the intent. So you know what you intended and how you intend to deliver on this. And I think that that's a very important part about being clear about what your strategic intent is so you can write it broadly so that it can shift in an agile environment, but it should still have an intent. And the last thing obviously would be around what is the vision? So the long-term intervention, we speak of the dream. And I think if you have those three aspects, you can still keep agility. And so I want to say, first of all, to to you, Heather, um, well done on always being an agile speaker. It's always a pleasure to be able to see how you can traverse multiple um, platforms. Um, 
Jan and I completely agree. It's I, I'm just saying that it's a question of both and absolutely. So I'm in agreement with you. I think we're in quite a tough space around strategy. And Ross, I think you really engaged with us in a way that we were able to um, really, you know, get our teeth into certain things. And I really do appreciate the way that you were able to actually traverse a number of topics. And the fact that you're a Davinci alumnus makes us extra proud that we can actually see tips and all the things that you did. So I want to thank every single one of you that joined us today for giving of your time, because I think in these times, giving of your time is something that is really priceless. And to both Heather and to Ross, for giving of your time, your day and your knowledge in this. I really hope that you guys have enjoyed. Um, Linda, when is the next book review um, coming up? We'll do one sort of towards, um, you know, in, in about four months time. And I hope that you will all join us. And then, Ross, I hope to see you engaging with us at a Curiosita and various other aspects. And we will connect with you when Ross has released his book. So, Ross, you will let us know so that we can send it out sure. to the database. And then to everybody that's commented, I mean, I always find it fascinating, Janet. I really love your opinions on various different things um, connected to this. But to everybody who um, participated, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. And have a wonderful evening. And please, with those of you based in South Africa, with the third wave hitting, please stay safe and look after your families. And we look forward to seeing you again on various other platforms. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful evening.